This conference will now be recorded. I'm going to record this because um, if anyone that you know may uh, not have had the opportunity to listen to this this evening, um, my plan is finally to make these events available on our YouTube channel. So I will send out notifications on that um, afterwards. If someone is on, hold on. All right, I am going to, hopefully you can still hear me, um, but I have everyone else muted, so we're not getting feedback. So can you hear me? If someone can just raise their hand and make sure you can hear me. Okay, all right, good. Um, but anyway, my plan is to make these available on YouTube, and I know people have asked over the years about um, having these available, and you know with our live events, I always record them, but uh, one of these days, hopefully, I will uh, have an opportunity to finally edit some of those older older events. But, um, but that's neither here nor there for this evening. Um, what I'd like to do is I'm going to share my screen and do my usual introductory remarks, and then I'll introduce our speaker. Uh, and then we'll turn things over to him. What I do request um, is that if we can all stay muted, except for myself and then Mike um, for the presentation, we can then open things up for questions um, at the end. In addition, you probably can see um, a chat function actually in the um, upper right-hand corner of your webinar screen. There's a little, you see two people, which shows the tally of people that are attending the conference. And to the right of that, there's a little thing that looks like a bubble. And if you click on that, it'll turn white. And then you can actually type in comments. So if you have questions during the presentation that you wanna just send a question, feel free to do that. I'll be taking a look at those and I can kind of referee those questions um, as well, if that's helpful. Otherwise, like I said, we can we can open things up um, if you have questions at the end. All right, so hopefully that works for everybody. So now I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Okay, and hopefully everybody can see that. Um, so uh, you did all receive this information regarding the webinar, because otherwise you wouldn't be here this evening. Um, but let's see, I need to make sure I can advance my screen. There we go, okay. So um, I will be, uh, I think you may have seen this um, that I sent around on the email, just some webinar basics, but I think pretty much everybody sort of knows we have everybody muted um, right now, but you can also, you know, if you want to speak, you can click the microphone at the lower part of your screen to um, to be able to speak. And you can toggle your camera on and off if, if you don't want us to see you. Um, and then we talked about the chat function on the right hand part of the screen. So I think we have that pretty much figured out. Um, so again, welcome to the History in Our Backyard Lecture Series. Um, this is our spring 2020 kickoff, and as you all know, we have gone virtual, and uh, I really appreciate you uh, participating this evening. Um, you know, obviously with the ongoing pandemic and the challenges with sort of reopening the economy in uh, southeastern Pennsylvania, um, we have not been able to really do that. And frankly, to be honest, I don't want to put anyone at risk. So, you know, the fact that these webinar platforms uh, are really pretty easy to use. I thought, why don't we give this a try? And, you know, fortunately, anyone that I had asked to be speakers for this year, all were very gracious and willing to uh, convert to the webinar platform. So I think for the foreseeable future, that's probably what we're going to do. The one other thing that I think is potentially advantageous by the by using the webinar platform is number one, I talked about the recording option, but also this does open up the potential for me to be able to bring additional programming to everyone um, by uh, being able to have people from other parts of the country who may be unable to travel to Warminster, Pennsylvania uh, to be able to present. So, uh, so that I'm pretty excited about as well. So uh, I think you'll hear more about other programming I have kind of in the works for 2021 and beyond. Um, and um, you probably have seen this schedule, which is available on the Facebook site 
um, as well as I email this stuff out periodically. Uh, you can see July, our next program on July 9th will be at six o'clock Eastern time uh, to accommodate a gentleman from Czechoslovakia. So it will be rather late for him, um, but we didn't want to go much later than six o'clock for him to give his talk. But um, that will actually be our first international speaker who's going to be talking about the um, about Czechoslovakia and uh, and basically the Cold War view from uh, you know from Eastern Europe. So I'm looking forward to that discussion uh, very much. Um, and uh, I will be actually reprising my Space Race of Bucks County lecture. I do have some new slide material to show everyone. And I thought that it might be interesting for those who have not been to Warminster, Pennsylvania, to the Johnsville Centrifuge. I'm also going to put together a little virtual tour to walk everyone through. So. Uh, you'll have to join us in August. In September, actually, this is a postponed presentation where we'll have um, Bill Causey, who's actually a uh, docent at the National Air and Space Museum, will be speaking about his recently published book about John Hubolt. And then finally, October, um, we'll have a special viewing of a documentary um, about uh, a, a gentleman who was uh, uh, a spy who was imprisoned in the uh, Stasi prisons in uh, East Germany uh, for six years. Um, so that's another interesting story. And again, we're going to be showing the documentary um, online and then having discussion afterwards. And speaking of Chris Sturdivant, who will be one of the hosts for the uh, documentary, um, we had Chris speak last year in April. Um, and uh, about Cold War Wisconsin. He's coming out with another book in August called Cold War Illinois. So um, I just wanted to give a little plug for his book that's coming out. And um, as I mentioned, we're going to be posting these videos on the YouTube channel. Um, so, you know, if you have a chance to check out our YouTube channel online, I do have some other things up there. Some, uh, some of our um, prior interviews, oral history interviews, uh, that have had partial edits of some significant clips. Um, we have those up for your enjoyment and some other related things, primarily related to centrifuge, uh, the Johnsville centrifuge and, and centrifuge operations that I have up on there as well. But again, um, these lectures are gonna be up as well. Um, you know, again, always a reminder, if you, um, do not get emails from me. Um, I try not to send, I try not to bombard everybody with over the lot of emails. Um, but if you're not receiving emails from me, um, check, send me a message on Facebook um, or uh, check your junk mail folder because sometimes um, things can end up in, in the spam folder. Um, so just a reminder to make sure that uh, you can hear from us um, if you so desire. And uh, also, if anyone has any suggestions for topics, I'm always open to that. Um, again, with the general Cold War theme, um, that's certainly obviously our focus, but uh, I certainly would welcome, uh, welcome your input. And also just a shameless plug, of course, uh, for the fact that we are a nonprofit organization, a 501c3, um, and if you so choose to make a donation to our organization, um, then um, you know one easy way to do that is through Amazon Smile. Uh, if you go to smile.amazon.com, um, you can um, designate a small percentage of your purchases to um, actually to go to our organization on a quarter. And then that's all any purchases, uh, those contributions are aggregated and, and provided to the organization on a quarterly basis. So um, you know, very much appreciated if you have done that in the past, but just wanted to mention that. And of course, as I've said over and over, thank you guys for your continued support of these programs. Um, it's it's a it's a privilege and an honor to be able to bring these this type of programming uh, to everyone, uh, particularly from the southeastern Pennsylvania area. So, without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our speaker this evening, Mike Jenny. So, just give me this moment here. So, Mike, um, I actually met in Huntsville several years ago when I was there for a, uh, a trip and um, had the opportunity to get to know a little bit about Mike and uh, some of his books. And uh, he is a writer of historical fiction and 
his first novel, um, Blue Gemini, uh, was the first installment of a trilogy of the Blue Gemini series, and that was released in 2015. And he has two other books, Blue Darker Than Black and Pale Blue, and the, those were released in 2016. And if you have a chance to read those, I would highly recommend it. They're they're very very good. Um, and uh, in addition, Mike is a licensed pilot, lifelong aerospace aficionado, and an amateur space historian. And he is a native of Huntsville, Alabama. Um, in addition, he was trained as an Army Ranger and uh, military freefall parachutist. And he's also a former Special Forces officer who served across the globe, including deployments in Central America, Haiti, the Middle East, and Afghanistan. Um, as a Special Forces survival instructor in the early 80s, he worked directly with Lieutenant James and Nick Rowe um, and other former Vietnam POWs to develop the Army's Survival, Evasion, Resistance, and Escape School at Camp McCall in North Carolina. And Mike and his wife, Adele, uh, they are back in Huntsville. They make their home there. And with that, I am going to turn things over to Mike. So just give us a moment because... With this webinar technology, I need to switch the presenter so Mike can actually present his slides. So I'm going to actually stop sharing my screen and I am going to turn things over to Mike. Let me scroll down on the list here to find Mike. And there we go. And there we go. I, Mike, you are now the presenter, so I'm going to turn things over to you, and I'm going to go on mute. I wrote a fictional trilogy called Blue Gemini, which takes place largely during the Cold War. Just so it's clear, I'm not here to sell books. If you want to read them, they're available on Amazon and plenty of other places. Just so you're aware, even though I write fiction, I try to integrate as much historical fact as possible so that the fictional aspects are tightly interwoven with actual history. I'm fond of telling people that the story is about 80% true and 20% fiction, and it's up to the reader to decide which is which. If I do my job effectively, in fact, and fiction are seamlessly joined, and it becomes difficult for the reader to discern one from the other. As an example, there are two massive storms in the second book. One storm is a hurricane, and the other storm is in space, and both have tremendous consequences in the story. Both storms actually occurred in August 1972, exactly as described in the book. As another example, there's a scene in the first book where Soviet agents steal a guidance computer from a Gemini spacecraft that's stored in a Smithsonian Institution warehouse. Here's that computer. It was some extremely sophisticated technology in that era. It weighed about 70 pounds and was mounted in an equipment bay just to the left of the command pilot. The fictional vignette about the Soviet burglars is oh, harsh. In the present, it's probably hard for us to imagine that recently flown spacecraft might be kept where they could possibly own the burglars. But that's exactly what happened. After the Gemini program ended in 1966, NASA abruptly transferred all the flown flight hardware to the Smithsonian. At the time, NASA's attitude was, we're in the business of going to the moon, not the museum business. The Smithsonian jammed them into a warehouse at their aircraft restoration facility in Silver Hill, Maryland, and they remained there until they parceled them out to other museums. True fact. The story is set during the Cold War. And although I grew up in that era, I still had to do an enormous amount of research, and I learned some fascinating things in the process. As a case in point, there's a lot being said these days about space force, 
and the possible necessity to intercept and destroy hostile satellites in orbit. How many of you are aware that the United States actually fielded an operational anti-satellite system, which used Thor rockets equipped with nuclear warheads from 1962 to 1975? We'll talk a little bit more about that later. The Cold War was an era of great turmoil. In addition to the challenges we faced at home, like the civil rights struggle and the war on poverty, we're also facing off against the Soviets on three major fronts. The Cold War, a hot war in Vietnam, and the space race. And beyond all that, there was a war in the shadows as well, with unprecedented espionage and intelligence gathering. It was also a unique era. For one thing, as a nation, we were willing to take monumental risk, many of which would probably be unthinkable in today's environment. As a nation, we took these risks in full view of the world, unlike our counterparts on the other side of the Iron Curtain. As a case in point, the Soviets were anxious to brag about executing the first spacewalk, but the free world did not learn until years later that cosmonaut Alexei Linov's spacesuit overinflated to the point where it was almost unable to come back into the spacecraft to go home. Besides our willingness to assume enormous risk, another fascinating aspect of the Cold War era is how much, how much of it was dominated by a very few unique personalities. There's a concept in nuclear deterrence called the nuclear triad, in which the arsenal of nuclear weapons is divided between bombers, submarines, and ICBMs. During a large stretch of the Cold War, these three men were the nuclear triad incarnate. On the left, General Curtis LeMay commanded the Strategic Air Command and the Air Force for over a decade. In the middle, for three decades, Hiram Rickover personally controlled anything and everything to do with nuclear-powered submarines and vessels. On the right, General Bernard Schriever oversaw the development of all Air Force ICBMs, including the Thor, Atlas, Titan, and Minuteman. Before he retired in 1966, Schriever personally controlled over 40% of the Air Force's annual budget, roughly $7 billion. His organization oversaw 27,000 military personnel and 37,000 civilian workers. He is also deeply involved in the Air Force's plans for military manned spaceflight programs. It's worth noting that while Schriever exerted such tremendous influence over the military in his tenure, his impact on spaceflight continues to this day. Virtually all of his military ICBMs eventually were used to launch both military satellites as well as those for peaceful purposes. The Atlas rocket, which you see just to his right, has launched almost 600 payloads. The Atlas first flew in 1957. An updated version, the Atlas V, is still used to this day. All of you probably recognize this gentleman, Werner von Braun. As you're likely aware, he got a start in military rockets in Germany and then came to the U.S. as part of Operation Paperclip after World War II. While he was working for the U.S. Army, von Braun's Jupiter C rocket succeeded in launching the first American satellite, Explorer 1, in January of 1958. The Eisenhower administration initially gave this task to the Naval Research Laboratory, which was developing a launch vehicle, the Vanguard rocket, for peaceful purposes, rather than giving the job to Von Braun's team, whose Jupiter C was adapted from a military rocket. The Vanguard failed in December of 1957. After Von Braun moved to NASA, he led the development of the first successful rocket, the Saturn V, 
that was purpose-built for the peaceful exploration of space. There were also some unique and powerful personalities on the other side of the Iron Curtain. These two gentlemen led competing aerospace design bureaus in the Soviet Union, and they were arch rivals. On the left is Vladimir Chelomy. We'll talk about some of his contributions shortly. On the right is Sergei Korolov. The Soviet leaders considered Korolov so essential to their rocket and space programs that his identity was kept secret until after his death. He was publicly known as the chief designer. Although he died in 1966, his influences continue to this day. In fact, of all these men we've seen, Korolov was probably the most influential of all. In 1945, immediately after World War II, he started work on the Soviet version of the German V-2 which had become this R7 Semyorka ICBM, a modified version of the R7 launch Sputnik, the world's first artificial satellite in 1957, and later launched the Vostok spacecraft that carried cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin to orbit in April of 1961. Besides his amazing designs, probably the greatest influence that Korolev had on the Soviets was the notion that once you had a proven rocket or spacecraft design, you stuck with it. An upgraded version of the R-7 is still used to launch the Russian Soyuz spacecraft to ferry cosmonauts and astronauts to the International Space Station. As of 2018, the R-7 had been used to launch 1,850 manned and unmanned spacecraft. After the U.S. stopped flying the space shuttle in 2011, the R-7 and Soyuz became the only available means to take people to and from the ISS, at least until last month's launch of the commercial Crew Dragon by SpaceX. The Soyuz spacecraft was also designed by Korolev's bureau in the 60s, although Korolev died before the design was completed and had its first manned flight in April 1967. Even though its sole cosmonaut was killed after re-entry, the Soviets fixed the Soyuz and continued to fly it, even after experiencing another fatal accident that killed three cosmonauts in 1971. Given all his enormous successes, is it possible that Korolev ever failed? Korolev was a leading force be behind the Soviet's program to land a man on the moon before the United States. His design bureau created the massive M1 rocket to compete with the Saturn V, but it failed to launch on all four attempts. While NASA was flying its early manned missions to validate the concepts necessary to get to the moon, the Air Force was making plans for its own space programs, which would have used military astronauts to execute purely military objectives. This is the X-20A dinosaur hypersonic space plane. Dinosaur is short for dynamic soaring. The X-20A would have been used as a platform for reconnaissance and satellite maintenance, as well as an interceptor to inspect and destroy enemy satellites. Initial versions of the X-20A would have been launched on a modified Titan II. Later versions would have been launched on a Titan III-C. Six military astronauts and one civilian were selected to fly the X-20A. I want you to pay attention to this gentleman. His name is Al Cruz. We will see him again. Although the X-20A was canceled in 1963, much of the research that went into it later proved invaluable to the development of the space shuttle. To imply that the X-20A was ahead of its time would be a gross understatement. 
In September 1962, President John F. Kennedy made a space at Rice University in which he famously declared, we choose to go to the moon in this decade. Obviously, at the time Kennedy challenged us to go to the moon, there were still a lot of critical concepts to prove that we could actually get there and back safely. Virtually all of these critical tasks were tested and validated during the 10 manned flights of Project Gemini, which flew between 1965 and 1966. In order to get to the moon, NASA had to prove that space craft could rendezvous and dock in space. They also had to demonstrate that astronauts could survive in space for extended periods of time and that they could leave their spacecraft to conduct extravehicular activity, or EVA, in the harsh environment of space. The Gemini was launched on a man-rated Titan II rocket. The Gemini was a superbly designed and very versatile vehicle just about as close as you can come to a fighter aircraft built to fly in space. It was an ingenious modular design with key components arranged in bays that could easily be accessed to allow replacement or repair. Although it was a crucial program, things didn't go precisely as planned. Those 10 Gemini flights were not without incident, but the program went on as planned which illustrates the risk that we were willing to accept to achieve Kennedy's objective of going to the moon. There were three near catastrophic incidents on three successive flights within just a six month period. Two astronauts were only milliseconds away from ejecting from Gemini 6 on the launch pad when there was a failure with their booster, but they chose not to eject and were able to launch three days later to execute the first orbital rendezvous with Gemini 7. On Gemini 8, two astronauts could have been killed when their spacecraft tumbled out of control soon after docking with an Agena target vehicle. Once they undocked and regained control, they immediately returned to Earth. One of these astronauts was Neil Armstrong, who would later walk on the moon. On Gemini 9, astronaut Gene Cernan became so overheated during a spacewalk that his helmet visor fogged over, and he was fortunate to just safely return to the spacecraft and get his hatch closed. In a program called Blue Gemini, the Air Force intended to continue flying the Gemini spacecraft after the NASA missions were done, but that program was canceled not long after it was started. One key objective of Blue Gemini was to develop techniques to inspect and disable hostile satellites. The Air Force built some fascinating stuff to facilitate this, including an astronaut maneuvering unit, or AMU. The AMU was kind of a Buck Rogers jetpack that would allow an astronaut to exit the, GM, the Gemini, fly clear independently, and maneuver around a hostile satellite. The AMU was actually flown on Gemini 9. It was supposed to be tested by astronaut Gene Cernan, but he experienced such serious overheating issues that the test was canceled. The AMU was rescheduled to be flown on Gemini 12. Astronaut Buzz Aldrin trained intensely to fly it and also to improve EVA techniques in general but the AMU test was canceled prior to Gemini 12's flight. There was some other unique technology intended for Blue Gemini. This is something called a paraglider, which would have, let, would have allowed the spacecraft to return to land instead of splashing down at sea. You're probably wondering what the logic is behind the paraglider. Here are three thoughts. With a paraglider, you can land a spacecraft on a remote airstrip with very little public fanfare or attention. It also eliminates the need and cost associated 
with having a fleet of Navy ships to support a splashdown. Additionally, a spacecraft is packed full of wiring and sensitive electronics that are very susceptible to corrosion. So once you dunk one in salt water, you can't use it again. But a Gemini that lands by paraglider can be refitted and recycled. The paraglider wasn't a casual endeavor or afterthought. As they de designed the Gemini, the engineers at McDonnell Douglas took into account both NASA's and the Air Force's requirements. Consequently, from the very outset, the Gemini spacecraft was specifically designed around the paraglider, even though it was never flown. The diagram and photo here depict the considerable space allocated to accommodate the Gemini skid landing gear. That large amount of volume could have otherwise been used to make the interior considerably more spacious. Also, the suspension system for the parachute was initially designed around the paraglider. Even though a blue Gemini was scrubbed, the military and NASA did come to an agreement whereby military experiments were flown on NASA Gemini missions. The Air Force AMU was a prime example. As part of this agreement, many of the military experiments were installed before flight and removed afterwards without public knowledge. Of the 49 experiments flown on Gemini missions, 16 were DOD experiments. After Blue Gemini, the Air Force shifted its focus to a far more ambitious program, the Manned Orbiting Laboratory. From here on, I'll refer to the M Manned Orbiting Laboratory by its initials, MOL. This is the most often seen image of the MOL, but it's actually very inaccurate. Amongst other things, it depicts the Gemini reentry vehicle separating from the MOL without the adapter that contains the retro rockets necessary to return to Earth. Needless to say, that would be a bit problematic. This is a slightly more accurate representation of the MOL. MOL was an odd program in that it was both classified and public at the same time. In 1965, President Lyndon Baines Johnson publicly announced the MOL program. Despite this, no one within the military, especially the astronauts assigned to fly on it, could disclose the actual purpose of the MOL. Although LBJ specifically stated that the U.S. would not orbit weapons of mass destruction, the rest of his announcement was rather vague, and a veil of, a veil of secrecy immediately descended over the program. Since the actual intent of the program was such so classified, many people, including the public, elected officials, and our adversaries, wanted to know why the military felt compelled to put their own astronauts in orbit. By the way, the true mission of the MOL was not declassified until 2015, 50 years after LBJ revealed the MOL to the public. At the time, the Air Force publicly described it as a platform in which astronauts could learn to live and function in space for extended periods of time, which is somewhat true, but still misleading. If somebody didn't know any better, when they're visualizing a platform where astronauts are learning to live and function in space, then they might think of something like this. This is the interior of Skylab which is probably the roomiest and most comfortable spacecraft that we've ever put in orbit. But the MOL is considerably less spacious than Skylab. It was a very tight fit. It has been described as having about as much free space as the interior of a Volkswagen bus. There's a reason for this. Although the MOL was built around the second stage of a Titan II rocket, approximately half that space was occupied by a gigantic spy camera system called the KH-10 Dorian. The MOL's true mission was to serve as a manned orbital reconnaissance platform. 
the MOL would be launched into a polar orbit by a man-rated version of the Titan 3C rocket. The polar orbit would enable it to pass over every point on the Earth within a 24-hour period. A two-man crew would occupy the MOL for 30-day missions and then return to Earth in a modified Gemini spacecraft. The baseline MOL would eventually evolve into multiple variants for different missions. Why was it classified? In this era, U.S. official policy was not to acknowledge even the fact that we operated spy satellites. Now, you might think this reluctance was due to some international treaty that outlawed spy satellites, but in fact, it was based on a unilateral decision made by President Ken Kennedy during the early days of his administration. President Nixon considered changing this non-disclosure policy in 1972, but Henry Kissinger advised him not to do so. It was not until 1978 that the United States finally acknowledged that we were operating spy satellites. President Jimmy Carter did so before signing the SALT II Treaty. Obviously, if the U.S. wasn't going to admit to operating spy satellites, then we surely weren't going to reveal the true intent of the MOL. Although the average American citizen has never heard of the MOL, it was a massive undertaking. At the time of its cancellation, $1.3 billion had been spent on the MOL. Several major corporations were involved. Martin Marietta was building the main portion of the station. Eastman Kodak, which was a contractor for several spy satellite systems, was constructing the KH-10 camera system. Approximately 100,000 military personnel and civilian aerospace workers were actively employed in building it. A massive launch site, Space Launch Complex 6, was built at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. Special spacesuits were developed especially for the MOL crews. Flight and training hardware were fabricated at various facilities across the country. There was actually a test launch in 1966 to evaluate some key components of the MOL. 17 military astronauts were selected to fly on the MOL. They were chosen in three groups between 1965 and 1967. Ironically, the first MOL selectee to earn his astronaut wings was also one of the first men to leave the program. Test pilot Mike Adams was selected in the first MOL astronaut group in November 1965. He's standing on the far left in this photo. He left the MOL program in July 1966 to fly the X-15. On his seventh flight, he reached an altitude of 81 kilometers, which qualified him for the award of Air Force astronaut wings, but his X-15 went into a violent Mach 5 spin and broke apart. His astronaut wings were awarded posthumously. Here's something else historically significant and also tragic about the MOL astronauts. Major Robert H. Lawrence was selected for the program in the third group of MOL astronauts. Major Lawrence is second from the left in this photo. He was killed in a training accident in December of 1967. Had he survived and had the program continued, he certainly would have been the first African-American man in space. Since we know the MOL's true mission, reconnaissance, what value could have been added by having humans on board? Well, for one thing, a man can repair or adjust things that are broken or not operating smoothly. Sounds far-fetched, right? Not necessarily. In that era, American spy satellites were incredibly complex machines 
with a huge number of moving parts, mostly because they relied on capturing images with conventional film. Those of you who have used conventional cameras and film probably remember how easy it is for film to get jammed in sprockets. In this case, the film travels several feet and makes several turns as it moves from a storage reel through an imaging system until the exposed film was spooled into a bucket-shaped re-entry vehicle. After the bucket re-entered and deployed its parachute, it was snatched out of the air by a recovery aircraft. Like most complex systems, it didn't always work as advertised. If you look at the history of unmanned spy satellites, you would see that there were just about as many failures as there were successes. The design of photo reconnaissance satellites provide another example of Soviet designer Korolev's influence. In the US model, after the film buckets were returned to Earth, the incredibly complicated and expensive optical systems and electronics were discarded in orbit. Needless to say, that was an extremely costly approach. In his Zenit design, Korolev packed everything, optical systems, electronics, and film handling equipment into a massive spear-shaped re-entry vehicle that was roughly eight feet in di diameter and weighed over two tons. After the reconnaissance mission was complete, everything returned to Earth in the re-entry vehicle. Not only could the costly equipment be reused, this design was much simpler since the exposed film did not have to be spooled into a separate re-entry vehicle. By the way, if the Zenith's design looked familiar, it's because Karloff designed it to be used both as, re as a reconnaissance satellite and to carry cosmonauts. As the Vostok, it carried Yuri Gagarin to orbit in 1961. But back to our question, is it realistic to believe astronauts could really fix stuff in space? Skylab certainly answered that question. It was badly damaged after launch, but the first crew was able to execute a series of spacewalks to make repairs and salvage the mission. But could astronauts repair complex optical systems in space? Obviously, the images from the Hubble Space Telescope tell us that they can, since a team of shuttle astronauts essentially had to perform cataract surgery on the Hubble in 1993. NASA went on to conduct four more servicing missions to repair and upgrade the Hubble between 1997 and 2009. While being able to fix stuff is great, the primary mission to put men on the MOL was to function as trained observers. Trained observers can recognize patterns. In contrast to the spy satellites of that era, they could discern color. Would being able to see color make much of a difference? I can cite an example from my own experience. In 2002 to 2003, I spent several months at a former Soviet Air Force base. The first US forces to arrive there found that large areas of the ground were literally colored blue which would have not shown up on a monochromatic satellite photograph. Just so you know, that blue colored ground turned out to be very significant later. In order to capture the images that would really be of value to analysts and decision makers, the observers could make adjustments such as tweaking the focus, selecting a film appropriate to the target and changing the viewing aspect. If cloud cover obscured a target, they could simply refrain from taking photos and wasting valuable film. An automated spy satellite could not make this distinction and would keep snapping pictures even if they proved to later to be worthless. We've all heard the expression that a picture is worth a thousand words. A corollary in the intelligence realm is that a picture leads to a thousand questions. A trained observer will ignore the obvious and focus on things that really matter. What do I mean by this? 
All reconnaissance efforts boil down to this. An observer watches a target area for signature activities and equipment. At the dirt level, if you're looking at an armor division, you have to have the mental dis discipline to look beyond the obvious, hundreds of tanks, and pick out the command and control and support vehicles that are the real clues to that unit's mission and capabilities. Likewise, if you're looking at an airfield, the things that are often the most crucial are forklifts, ordnance handling equipment, and fuel tankers. Seeing an ICBM on a launch pad may be important, but the equipment in its immediate vicinity may provide a better insight on its capabilities and readiness to launch. But probably the greatest value of having men aboard the MOL was that they could provide a near real-time reporting capability. Intelligence is perishable. It is most valuable if it can be delivered to key decision makers as swiftly as possible. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, President Kennedy saw photos of Soviet missile sites just hours after they were taken. Roger Chaffee, who had later perished in the Apollo 1 fire, was one of the naval aviators who risked his life to capture those images. The Air Force realized the value of near real-time intelligence very early. A major objective of their very first planned reconnaissance satellite, SAMOS, was to elect electronically transmit imagery, although they failed to develop this as an operational capability. The Air Force first started developing SAMOS in the mid-50s. Although the system had extensive limitations, test missions were launched in 1960 and 61, but the technology failed and it was not revisited, at least by the Air Force. Ironically, when NASA asked for proposals for systems to photograph the moon's surface in advance of the Apollo landings, Eastman Kodak, the primary contractor for the Samos imagery system, received permission to team with Boeing to build the Lunar Orbiter spacecraft. Their proposal was approved and Eastman Kodak was able to surreptitiously transfer the Samos imaging system technology to NASA. Five Lunar Orbiter missions were flown between 1966 and 1967. Why is near real-time reporting so critical? Let's imagine that an unmanned spy satellite captured perfect images of Soviet armored divisions loading tanks at rail yards. That might be the precursor to the Soviet bloc invasion of Western Europe. But if that film bucket wasn't dropped for another week or so, those images would be of little value if an onslaught of T-62s had already crossed the Fulda Gap. It's important to note that for near real-time reporting, imagery isn't absolutely necessary. A trained observer could verbally report suspicious activities at key locations. So when did the U.S. actually achieve a near real-time capability? It was not until 1976, seven years after the MOL's cancellation and five years after the MOL would have first flown. Let's talk about the MOL's cancellation. After years of development, the MOL ran afoul of a perfect storm in early 1969. A new president, Richard Nixon, occupied the White House. The Vietnam War was underway. Nixon and members of Congress were under pressure to significantly reduce military spending. At this point, the MOL was over budget and behind schedule. Only a handful of senators and congressmen were read in on the MOL's true mission. So many elected officials in the public were still asking, what exactly could military astronauts do that could not be accomplished by, by NASA astronauts? Bear in mind that Skylab was already being planned. So the MOL was obviously seen as a redundant effort. Behind the scenes, a confrontation had been brewing between the CIA 
in the Department of Defense over the MOL. The CIA resented DOD's intrusion into satellite reconnaissance and was concerned about the amount of money and resources that were being dedicated to the MOL. The CIA was eventually successful in convincing key decision makers that although the MOL might provide exceptionally good imagery, it was ultimately not worth the cost since comparable imagery could be produced by sat spy satellites currently in development. It should be noted that they apparently neglected to bring up the importance of near real-time reporting, especially since it would be another seven years before they achieved this capability. Consequently, in June 1969, Secretary of Defense Melvin Laird announced that the MOL program had been canceled. Let's think about that for a moment. Since we decisively won the Cold War, the decision to cancel the MOL was obviously a good one, right? But as the president and his advisors contemplated their choices, the situation was anything but clear. They didn't know if the Soviet bloc might eventually invade Western Europe or whether international tensions might one day escalate into a nuclear exchange. In my opinion, probably the biggest factor contributing to the MOL's demise was the intense secrecy surrounding the effort. This level of secrecy led to some bizarre situations. During unclassified congressional hearings in 1965, elected officials from Florida demanded to know why the Air Force insisted on launching the MOL from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. The Air Force essentially replied, we can't tell you why, but the MOL's mission requires that it be launched into a polar orbit, and we can't do that from Florida. The MOL program was abruptly canceled in June 1969, just a month before America landed on the moon. Needless to say, the cancellation sent shockwaves through the aerospace industry as thousands of workers were suddenly laid off. This was at a time when contractor work on the Apollo program was effectively complete, even though there were yet missions to fly and there, and there was no major space-related projects on the horizon. After the program's cancellation, several astronauts transferred to NASA as NASA Astronaut Group 7. Of those, seven would go on to fly on the fledgling missions of the space shuttle. Robert Crippen, in the middle of this group, flew on the space, first space shuttle mission with veteran astronaut John Young. Richard Truly is the second man from the right. After flying on the shuttle twice, Truly was selected to be the NASA administrator in 1988, becoming the first former astronaut to lead the agency. This is James Abrahamson. He chose not to transfer to NASA, but remained in the Air Force. Later, President Ronald Reagan appointed him to lead the Strategic Defense Initiative, more commonly known as Star Wars. This gentleman is Al Cruz. If you remember, Cruz was originally selected to fly the X-20A dinosaur and then was selected as an MOL astronaut in the first group in 1965. When the MOL astronauts were given an opportunity to transfer to NASA in 1969, NASA set an age limit and Cruz was deemed too old. By the way, if you're ever around Cape Canaveral and want to meet a genuine American hero, Al Cruz volunteers at the Air Force Sands Space History Center, which is tucked in behind the Port Canaveral cruise ship docks just right of the entrance to the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Call ahead to make sure he's there. The last time I talked to him, Al still pilots his own airplane as well. At the time of its cancellation, with very few exceptions, like some of the optics and computer systems, 
Most of the MOL hardware was scrapped or destroyed outright. There are only two major artifacts on display in aerospace museums. Both are the Air Force variants of the Gemini spacecraft called Gemini B. This one is on display at the National Museum of the Air Force at Wright-Patterson. It was used for thermodynamic testing, but was never flown. The major difference between the NASA Gemini and the Air Force version is the Gemini B had a circular hatch cut through the heat shield. Once they got into orbit, they would open that hatch and then pass through a tunnel to enter the pressurized section of the MOL. This is astronaut Robert Crippen next to a Gemini B. The circular hatch is inside that green box. When they left the MOL to re-enter, the hatch would be welded shut by the intense heat of re-entry. No kidding. I interviewed Crippen in 2015 and asked him about the hatch, and he said that the MOL astronauts were entirely confident in it. Here you see an engineering mock-up of the Gemini B. If you look at the adapter section to the right, you'll see the transfer tunnel that passes from the Gemini B to the MOL. By the way, if you look just below the tunnel in the middle section of the adapter, you'll see a box-like structure. That's where the Gemini B six solid fuel retro rockets would be mounted. This is the second Gemini B on display in the museum at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. In an unmanned test, a Titan 3C launched a mock-up MOL and this spacecraft in November of 1966. It was actually a recycled spacecraft because it originally flew as the unmanned Gemini 2. For the MOL test, a circular hatch was cut through the heat shield to prove the concept. Even though the United States canceled the MOL, you might be surprised to learn that the Soviets had a parallel project called Almaz, which is Diamond, which also launched two-man crews on extended missions to conduct reconnaissance and surveillance missions. Vladimir Chelomy's Aerospace Design Bureau did most of the preliminary work on Almas. It would be launched with Chelomy's massive proton booster, which had originally been intended to be a supersized ICBM fueled with hypergolic propellants. Chelomy's originally design also called for a transfer vehicle called the TKS which would have been a competitor to Korolev's Soyuz. The Soviets threw, flew three manned Almas missions between 1973 and 1976. Intentionally or not, they were flown in roughly the same period as the Soviet Soyuz space stations. It was not until years later that the free world learned that the Soviets had launched both peaceful and military space stations. Because the Soviets were convinced that the United States was building satellite interceptors, they armed the Almaz with a modified anti-aircraft cannon. I want to conclude this presentation by briefly describing why I wrote the Blue Gemini trilogy. It's a story of the Cold War, which is swiftly becoming a forgotten period of our history. Young people today look back on the Cold War and believe that it was a foregone conclusion that the United States would inevitably triumph over the Soviet Union. Most people in the current generation don't comprehend the struggles and sacrifices that it took and the price that was paid by so many. I wrote Blue Gemini to tell a story and tell it well, or at least as best as I could. And even though it's fiction, I hopefully give my readers some insights into the nature of duty and service, and especially the sacrifices that people are compelled to make as they defend this great nation and freedom.
I want to mention that my website for the Blue Gemini series contains a large compendium of reference materials pertinent to the story. So if you want additional information on the topics we covered tonight, it's a good place to start. The website also contains an extensive collection of technical illustrations drawn by my brother Ed, a former illustrator for NASA. His illustrations depict much of the technology that is unique to the story. Thanks for sharing this time with me. I wish you all the best. That was great. Fantastic. And I just want to also let you guys know that if you want to buy, um, I think it's on, is it on Etsy, Mike, that you can get the uh, coffee mugs with that image of Blue Gemini that your brother um, created. All right. I'm going to go ahead and open things up for questions if people have them. Um, I didn't really see anything on chat, so I don't know if anyone has any questions. If you just want to kind of speak up, you can unmute and, and ask. No questions? Eleanor? Yes. Oh, up it's Dan. I'm under owner. Um, how come the uh, Air Force switched from Cape Canaveral to uh, Vandenberg? Was it for secrecy purposes? Mike, you, Mike, can you hear? Did you hear the question? I'll let you answer that, of course. Oh. Hold on just a second. Um, I think Mike may need to disconnect his audio. So hold on just a moment. Let me where he can reach us here. Send him a message, so hopefully he'll see that. Hmm. Mike, can you hear us? Is I apologize. I know that Mike had connected in his audio to kind of pre-record the presentation, so um, he may be having some difficulties in disconnecting that and getting back on regular audio. Um, if you, if anyone does have have questions that um, we're unable to answer this evening, please feel free to reach out to me um, at mail at coldwarhistory.org, and we can certainly get things addressed, no problem. And I can. I'm going to check one more time. Mike, can you hear us? No, I, don't, I apologize. I don't. I think Mike may be having some technical difficulties in, um, with his audio. Um, oh, hold on. I'm getting a message. Hold on. He says, give me a minute. So if you can bear with us, we'll get an answer about Cape Canaveral and Vandenberg. In the meantime, does anyone else have any, any other questions we can you can ask uh, while we're waiting for Mike to get back online. Uh, I have a question about the, uh, I believe it was the X-22, uh, the dyno. Um, was that designed to carry a crew up and um, repair craft or was that, uh, or would it just carry uh, satellites up? No, that's a great question. I think you're referring to the X-20, the dinosaur, and I'll have, um, certainly, I have Mike also address that as well. I believe that that was certainly planned to carry crew. 
And in fact, a little fun fact, um, there was uh, there were plans for centrifuge training for early dinosaur pilots to take place at Johnsville, actually. So a little, little fun factoid about that. And also, um, uh, just another little plug, um, Mike Adams was mentioned during Mike's presentation. Um, and uh, I am planning on having um, Michelle Evans come back to give uh, her talk about Mike, Mike Adams. Uh, and that'll probably be in early 2021. So um, I just wanted to give a plug for that. Um, I had a chance to, to visit the crash site actually with um, Michelle back in uh, early March. Um, so that was, uh, that was quite a moving experience. Um, and there is a memorial there now. Um, but uh, yeah, so stay tuned for that as well. Mike, are you, are you back on? I don't guess Eleanor? not. Eleanor, yes. Eleanor a quick question. Yeah. Uh, you are hearing me, great. Um, I just wanted to ask, this is just a fascinating presentation. I had no idea any of this existed. Uh, and I, that shows I'm not maybe perhaps as much of a space nut as I think I am. But uh, the one picture of Vandenberg Air Force Base seemed to show a space shuttle ready to be launched. Was that possibly the dinosaur, the X-20? Oh, that, that might have been. Um... That, that certainly might have been, because I don't think there were plans for shuttle to have launched from from Van, Vandenberg, um, but uh, hello, no. good pickup. Yep, hello. Hello there, yes. The shuttle was uh, originally designed to launch from Vandenberg, but they it was called Slick 6, and they didn't launch out of there because the they had concerns about earthquakes. So that's why they didn't launch a shuttle out of that out of Vandenberg. That oh, is so wow. interesting. I, I imagine the diagram that was shown was an artist's conception. It probably wasn't a, a photograph. Yeah, they had the facilities there. Cause I'm, I'm retired Air Force. They had the facilities there, but uh, they were afraid because of the uh, earthquakes and that they didn't want to risk a uh, a big program like that get destroyed if something happened. Wow. Amazing. Thank you. You're welcome. Fantastic. I know Mike says he he's exchanging some texts with me, so he's still trying to get back uh, back online. So apologize for the uh, for the technical difficulties this evening. Does anyone else have any other questions while we're waiting? Eleanor. Yes. Uh, it's Dan again. I have a I have a follow up on that uh, space shuttle at Vandenberg. My understanding was that the Air Force wanted to have their own space shuttle. Is that wrong, or was that NASA's space shuttle? It was originally going to be out of Vandenberg. I don't have a definitive answer for that, but there actually is a version of, of that now flying. The X, uh, they, you know, there have been several unmanned flights of a shuttle-like um, spacecraft that have been flying for a while. Hey, Eleanor, this is Dan Bramos. I can address that if you want. Oh, that'd be great. Please do. It, the, um, the original concept was that Discovery was going to be dedicated as the, uh, the quote-unquote military space shuttle and to be used out of Vandenberg. Mostly, um, and Vandenberg was, uh, the shuttle launch complex six at Vandenberg was designated because it would have put the shuttle and manned orbiting lab previous to that in a uh, polar orbit, so launching it above the the North Pole to circle around the Soviet Union through you know North Pole South Pole orbit, vice launching from Cape Canaveral, which puts you on an equatorial orbit. Oh, okay, well that raises an interesting question. So this Air Force shuttle, like I know I've seen it, I've seen periodically pictures of it, the unmanned vehicle, but where does that launch out of? Do you know? Uh, th that's the, uh, the X-37, and uh, yeah. that launches out of uh, Cape Canaveral, but it does have its, its own um, um, maneuvering systems on board. Oh, very good. Okay. Uh, Eleanor? Yes? Eleanor, can you? Chuck Phillips here. Hi. Hi, how are you? Very good. Thanks for joining. Okay. Um, I was uh, part of the team that launched the 
last eight um, Atlas missiles from Vandenberg, and they didn't have any uh, earthquake problems. Hmm. All right. So who All right. knows? <laughs> now I think um, Mike, can you Mike? Did you dial in? I did. Can you hear me? Yes. Now we can hear you. Great. I can repeat the questions that that have come up if if that's okay with you. Uh, no, I, I I heard them. I, I got a pretty good memory. Um, okay. the, the first the first question was on on why they decided to launch out of Vandenberg instead of launching from Cape Kennedy. Uh, is is that fellow still online? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Hey, the reason they did that is is that uh, the the main thing about launching into polar orbits is is that because of abort criteria primarily, you you can't overfly a populated area, and you can't do that from Cape Canaveral. Um, I, I, right offhand, I forgot the highest inclination you can launch into. I think it's um, I think it's 31 degrees, but you can launch into a polar orbit south from Vandenberg. So when they launched and they they launch into polar orbits from Vandenberg. Um, actually fairly frequently. Uh, but anyway, when they launch south out of Vandenberg, um, the launch trajectory does not take them over any populated areas. Does that, does that sound, does that make sense to you? Yes, it does. When I have you on the line, I have another question. I, I, I'm not familiar at all with this Blue Gemini, totally new to me. I'm assuming that Good. they landed in the ocean and none of this was made public. Uh, and did the Russians try to come up on our ships to uh, to surveil what was going on? Well, Blue, Blue Gemini, as, a, as we said in the presentation, never flew. Um, no, none of these programs, the military manned space flight programs flew. But at the same time, um, the you know, any time there was any kind of military activity going on, you could pretty much bet that the Soviets were either trying to fly over it or or move around it with one of their um, trawler ships. So they were constantly collecting intelligence. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, somebody else asked a question about the uh, um, the X-20A dinosaur, uh, whether it was designed just to carry satellites or personnel. The X-20A dinosaur was intended to carry one astronaut and also additional equipment. I don't know if it was designed to function as a, a satellite launch platform. I'm sure that it could have done that later um, with additional equipment, but it, it was it was only designed to be manned with one uh, one crew member. Uh, the more modern spacecraft that you're seeing that's an unmanned vehicle is the X-37B, and it it launches out of Cape uh, Cape Canaveral. And it typically goes up for multi-month missions. Um, there's one of them up there right now. And exactly what it does up there is classified. So none of us know. Um, but there's a lot of interesting ideas as, as to what it what it does and, and can't do. Uh, somebody asked a question about the uh, Slick 6 launch pad. What you saw in that picture was um, the, the Slick 6 uh, was after this is the pad at Vandenberg that was built for the MOL. Um, later on, it was used for Titan uh, 3M, or pardon me, not Titan 3M, but Titan 3C launches of various uh, satellites and was considered as a launch site for the uh, space shuttle. As a matter of fact, there was a uh, space shuttle, military space shuttle polar mission that was planned to launch from that site but it got canceled right after the Challenger accident. So no space shuttles launched from Vandenberg, but the facilities there are sufficient to accommodate the space shuttle. The space shuttle, the photograph you saw is an actual photograph. Um, there's a big mock-up space shuttle, I think it's called the Enterprise, that they use to test uh, ground facilities. And that, that was an actual, uh, uh, actual photograph of them testing it at that time. I, I heard a lot of discussions about earthquakes and why they didn't use it. Uh, to my to my knowledge, or pardon me, I've never heard anything about earthquakes. 
Um, strangely enough, one of the biggest constraints to launching out of Vandenberg is it's is there's a civilian railroad line that runs right next to it, and they have to um, they have to shut down that railroad line because of the classified launches that go out of Vandenberg. So I think I caught everybody's questions, unless somebody else has something. Yeah, I have. A I have one that I. Oh, typed go ahead. In. Sorry, I typed it in. I didn't. I was anyway. You want to know why it's canceled, right? Was it just too far ahead of the time? Yeah, the X twenty. The X. I'm oh, sorry. The X twenty was it? Why was it canceled? Basically, was it too far ahead of its time? Um, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Was it too far ahead of its time? Yeah. I, um. Quite frankly, I don't know. I, I think that I think it was a very ambitious program. Um, and the you know the technology was really just catching up with the ideas, but uh, to be quite frank, I think that um, they they probably could have flown the X-20A in that time frame. I mean, it's, it, it was amazing the amount of work that went into it. And uh, one one thing that's um, I, I I talked to Al Cruz in in 2015, and uh, and talked to him about the the MOL and the X-20A. And he said of the two programs, the one that he was really sorry that he didn't have the opportunity to fly was the X-20A. I mean, it literally brought tears to his eyes when he talked about it because there was so much that we could have learned from that program had it gone forward at that point. Mike, I've got a question for you. Can you tell us a little bit about how it is that you got interested in uh, in writing and specifically why you decided to focus on Gemini and and craft the uh, trilogy? Well, I've, I've been interested in writing for literally for years since I was young. And I actually wrote uh, four book length projects back in the 80s, none of which was published. I never, you know, never really um, put forth the effort to, to get them up to standards for publishing. But um, right after I came back from overseas in 2003, I decided that I was going to knuckle down and, and uh, you know, make a, a project, write a project that was worthy for publication. And one of the things that uh, I've always been interested or I've always thought about was what would have happened if the Air Force had been successful in in um, completing some of the programs, the military manned space programs that they started. And so the concept was is that um, the Blue Gemini uh, program was done in secret in response to a Soviet effort uh, to put up a manned, um, or pardon me, an orbiting nuclear weapons platform. So they built this capability and and uh, the Blue Gemini capability and ac actually launch missions um, to practice to practice this stuff. And uh, one one thing that was fun about writing it is is that when I first started it, it, it was uh, first started the series. It was really more of a Tom Clancy kind of technology heavy story. And as I got into it, I realized that the the human aspects of the story were actually a lot more interesting. So I, I think that's what you'll see. Um, when and if you read the books, um, there's a, a, a lot of side stories and parallel tracks and different threads that go on that involve people on the other side of the Iron Curtain, people here involved in support projects, etc. But there's a lot of fun to write, and I'm, I'm glad that it got published, even though we're not making any money. But that's neither here nor there. <laughs> All right. Any other questions before we wrap up? I have another question. The sure. um the X20 uh what rocket system was that intended to uh launch with? Uh the the initial the initial uh system would have been launched on the Titan 2. And then as they moved to a, a heavier version of the X20, the X20 was uh intended to have something called a service module, uh kind of like an extra stage. Um, that that would have flown with it, and it would have been ejected before they re-entered the Earth's atmosphere. But in order to get that extra weight into this into the orbit, they would have needed uh, a Titan III rocket, which is the which is a Titan II 
with uh, two solid rocket boosters uh, strapped onto it. Okay. All right. Well, I think we'll go ahead and um, one last oh. question. Oh, no problem. <laughs> Sorry. I'm still here. Are um copies of your brother's technical drawings available anywhere? Are you going to put them into a booklet or something? Thank you. If you uh, t two points on that. One, uh, if if you if you go to my website, and if you want to write this down real quick, if you didn't see it earlier, my website is mikejennybooks.com. All is one word, mikejennybooks.com. There it is. And um, all of those technical drawings, if you if you go down to the uh, down towards the bottom, and you see that uh, thing that says technical drawings, all of its technical drawings are available for download right there. You can scroll through them and you can see them. That, the first thing you see are a couple of prints that Ed has for sale. But the other thing, uh, Ed also has a website that is Ed Jenny, uh, E D J E N, pardon me, can't spell my last name, edjenny.com. And it has a lot of his other artwork. And it also has links for the uh, um, t shirt and the coffee mug that um, comes from that blue pattern you saw in the last slide we presented. But but Ed's just a phenomenally talented guy. Mm. All right, fantastic. All right. Well, thanks everyone. Um, I'm, I think this went reasonably well. Actually, I think it went very well this evening. And I wanna extend my thanks to Mike Jenny for, um, for being willing to be our first webinar participant. Um, and uh, please join us on July 9th. Again, it's going to be six o'clock to accommodate our speaker coming all the way from Prague, Czechoslovakia. So a first for us. And I'm looking forward to uh, to his lecture as well. So um, look for some emails with links and I will try to do my best to make sure we get links out to everyone. And again, if you want to get on our email distribution list, just send me an email at mail at coldwarhistory.org and I'll make sure to add you to the email distribution list. So with that, I am gonna go ahead and sign off and wanna thank everyone again for participating and hope you guys enjoyed this, enjoyed this and more to come. And thanks again, Mike. Thanks, appreciate being your test dummy, Eleanor. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thanks everyone, have a good night. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Fine job.